That's quite right. <laughs> okay, we're good to go. So, uh, that's great. Thank you, Matt. And uh, as I said, thank you very much for the opportunity to present this uh, HDA webinar on, on genetic testing. And thank you all for joining us today. Um, okay, so uh, some of the things that I wanted to um, to cover in this session. Uh, can I move this? Oh, can you move the slides? Or I'm going to do it for you. You're going to do the slides. Thank you. Um, so I guess, as Matt said, it's, it, I'm based in, in Manchester in the UK, and that's where all my experience uh, comes from, from working with uh, with HC families and, and taking people through uh, genetic testing. Uh, so I guess you know it's important for people to know that there might be differences in in other parts of the UK or or in other countries. But hopefully, I'll, in this talk, I'll I'll cover some of the main points that um, that you can expect to to cover in, in the genetic testing process. Uh, and in the UK, predictive genetic testing is is carried out in genetics clinics. Uh, so I thought it'd be helpful just to talk briefly about uh, genetic counselling um, before we move on to to give an outline of of the genetic test process. Uh, and some of the topics that often form part of the um, the pre-test discussions. And then finally, I'll mention some of the uh, the other resources that people often find useful when they're, when they're going through the testing uh, process. Thank you. So I guess I'd first like to um, correct a common misconception that a lot of people have about genetics clinics and genetic services. Uh, that really genetic counselling isn't just for people uh, who want to have a genetic test uh, and might cover a lot, an awful lot more than just testing, actually. So, for example, uh, genetic counsellors can go over uh, information such as clarifying the inheritance pattern and, and the risks for an individual, uh, as well as giving an overview of, uh, of some of the symptoms of HD. Um, so, obviously, lots of people will have grown up with HD in the family and have a good awareness, but um, it's important to identify that uh, you know, there might be some gaps or misunderstandings or misconceptions about things. So, so just to ensure that people are, are really well informed and, and, and the starting point for uh, for the discussions around the options available to them uh, around testing. Uh, another aspect of it is that we can be hopefully a good source of support for individuals at risk and particularly for example if there's been a recent diagnosis uh, and people might be only just adjusting to, to that um, status of being at risk. Uh, and often people find it quite useful to talk to someone outside the family uh, but still knows uh, a reasonable about about um, a reasonable amount, hopefully about HD, um, so someone a bit removed from the situation, um, but, but, but with a, that bit of knowledge, um, which will hopefully be, be helpful. Um, and part of that support might be, for example, identifying coping strategies, uh, as, well in, as well as making sure that people are aware of the other agencies and, and avenues for support that people might uh, find helpful, uh, and then referring on uh, if we need to. Uh, and then talking through obviously the various options around testing is, is a key part of genetic counselling um, but as well as the option around predictive testing uh, that this session is mainly focusing on uh, there might be other options and things to consider such as prenatal and reproductive options uh, not all of which uh, depend on someone having to have had the predictive test uh, and there's more information uh, about that on the HDEO website if people are, are interested in looking into those things uh, in a bit more detail uh, but obviously today I'm, I'm more focusing on the predictive testing aspects. Okay so um, I guess it's important to say that genetic testing really falls into one of two uh, categories so uh, actually it could be done in more of a diagnostic sense so if a doctor or, or specialist assesses someone to uh, to have signs of HD, for example, involuntary movements or, or some other features that they would uh, consider to be part of HD, uh, they may already make what they would call potentially a clinical diagnosis on that basis. And then the genetic blood test is really just to confirm that that diagnosis is the correct uh, diagnosis for that individual. Um, and because it's really just to clarify that, just to know what we already suspect, um, blood could be taken at the first appointment if the individual uh, wishes to go ahead that day. But in contrast, um, um, predictive testing, or sometimes called pre-symptomatic testing, uh, is approached quite differently, and that's what I'm going to focus mainly on in this uh, webinar. So this is where an individual has no current symptoms of HD, um, and therefore the genetic test is, is about revealing information for the future for that person, so for, i.e. whether they'll develop HD uh, later in life. 
Uh, and to ensure that people have the opportunity to weigh up the pros and cons of this type of test, uh, the blood sample wouldn't be taken at the first appointment. Uh, and I'll talk about the process involved, obviously, uh, through this session. But it's quite interesting and, and I guess, important to, to kind of be aware that only actually around 10 to 25 percent of individuals at risk of HD do choose to have a predictive test. And, and there might be lots of reasons for, uh, for those people who choose not to um, to have the test, uh, for example, uh, choosing to, to live at 50% risk, knowing that that feels easier for them than, than potentially having a test which could uh, show that they do have the, the gene. So, as I said, um, predictive testing involves this process that really is there to, as an aim to help people consider all the information and options open to them. Uh, and to help prepare for the results if they choose to go ahead and, and provide those sources of support that might help along the way. But unless the, the healthcare professional involved has you know, real serious concerns about the individual and, and, and what the impact might be of that test result, it wouldn't really ever be the intention to refuse access to the test. That, that isn't um, generally the, uh, the situation. It's more trying to put any support in place uh, to, to help the process be as easy as it, as it can for that person. I guess having said that, predictive testing for HD is covered by international guidelines um, that have been drawn up based on the experiences of the HD community as a whole, really. So uh, both healthcare professionals involved in testing, but also uh, some of the at-risk individuals who've gone through uh, the process. Um, and those guidelines uh, do have a couple of recommendations, um, particularly around minimum age. So that's uh, usually a minimum of age of 18 to access predictive testing. Um, and also recommend a minimum number of appointments, obviously before the blood sample was taken, as I said, uh, and actually a minimum time frame uh, between those pre-test appointments. Uh, just to give people time to reflect on, on their decision and, um, and to access you know, any necessary uh, support or information that they, that they might want. So we, it's broken down uh, into um, several different stages of predictive testing. So uh, the guidelines uh, have that there should be two, at least two appointments before the blood uh, sample is taken. Uh, and as part of those pre-test appointments, there may be the option of a neurological assessment, uh, which can sometimes be useful if there are any concerns regarding symptoms, really just to, to clarify that, that, that there is a predictive test rather than a diagnostic test being done. And if the individual still elects to proceed with the genetic test, they'll usually sign a, a consent form and then the blood sample is, is taken. Um, the testing in the lab normally takes about two or three weeks. Um, so what we normally do is set up a results appointment about four weeks after the blood sample is taken to give plenty of time uh, for the laboratory testing uh, to give the individual results uh, in clinic. And then regardless of the results, it would be usual to have some contact either by phone or, or in clinic in the, in the months after the appointment. Um, as we you know, recognise that the, there may be a period of adjustment after the results, or even things may come up at a later stage that people want to, to get back in touch with us, um, you know, possibly many years after the results. I guess as far as possible, we... You know, we do, although there are those guidelines, we, we try and tailor the predictive test process to, to the individual. And we often find that actually some of the issues that come up are, are very similar across the board, regardless of, of the age or circumstances. Um, and part of our role really is to explore these things and these issues in detail. Uh, and this does sometimes identify uh, particular aspects that, that people might not have already considered, which hopefully means that they're in the best place and, and, and as best prepared as they can be for, for whatever result they, they may end up with. Uh, and having said that, we, we do recognise that some um, parts of the process may be more or less helpful and, and more or less important depending on, on the individual and, and their background. And obviously we would try and recognise this and in, incorporate it uh, into, the, into the process. Okay, so um, I guess as I mentioned earlier, uh, an important first step in the process really involves an exchange of information between the person and the, and the, the person taking them through the testing. So the first pre-test appointment often involves lots of information. Uh, it might be in collecting information about the family history of HD, um, which helps us understand the background for that individual as, as well as establishing you know, what, the, what the risk is. And ideally, we'd always want to confirm the diagnosis in the family. 
uh, and this is really to ensure that we're giving accurate information uh, and that we would be uh, arranging the right test. And this is because you know, there are some rare conditions that cause symptoms that, that mimic HD and are almost identical, um, but are caused actually by a different genetic change. Uh, so we want to make sure we're, we're arranging the right test. We would also aim to cover general information uh, about HD, as I said, such as what symptoms it can cause and make sure people are familiar with the inheritance pattern uh, and that there's no misunderstandings. Um, you know, for example, sometimes people are under the impression that HD can, can skip a generation, which isn't actually the case. Um, so it's important people have a good understanding of, uh, of the basics of, of, of the inheritance. Uh, and, and important to know what the, what the test does uh, in terms of counting CAG repeats. Um, and I'll talk about that in more detail in a minute. Um, but we'd also cover things like uh, potential impact on insurance and employment, um, but as well as the as some of the developments uh, in terms of the treatment and the ongoing research that people may be interested in, in terms of you know the longer term, but hopefully uh, not too longer term uh, future of uh, HD uh, treatment. Okay, so. Um, we then usually move on to, to more sort of um, exploration of the individual circumstances So moving from the sort of general information to, to really kind of exploring you know, what the impact of the test might be for that individual, um, thinking about what types of coping strategies they, they may use and, and how they, these would fit with, with getting the, the result. Um, and I guess a big uh, thing that sometimes comes up is, is that feeling of will it change things in terms of worries about symptoms going from 50-50 to potentially knowing someone has the gene and, and how might that feel if, if concerns about symptoms uh, are raised. Um, how the test might affect other people, so uh, either present or, or, sorry I'm asking, yeah I will talk a bit slow, apologies, I'm rattling through, apologies Greg. Um, so um, whether people, yeah, whether the test would, would uh, affect other people. Um, such as pre present or future uh, relationships and also whether they envisage that it would affect any uh, other life de decisions such as around having children uh, or career plans or whether they would be intending just to carry on uh, pretty much as they are before having the test. I guess um, an individual's uh, ability or, and resilience to deal with the results might be affected by uh, previous or current health issues um, and particularly if someone has mental health issues that we, we might want to ensure that uh, the right support, right medication is in place uh, you know, to make sure that, that individual is in the best place before having the test. We often ask people whether they have a gut feeling about how the result will go uh, and if they do have a gut feeling, which is, is quite common actually, um, that actually they might find the opposite result um, actually harder to prepare for or to adjust to if the result does go against how they expect it to. The timing of the test can be quite a big thing and about quite a big part of the discussion. So it's not just about whether to have the test, but when to have the test. And something we always try and accommodate as best as possible. Um, so, for example, if if there's a big event coming up in the family, a, a big family wedding, or if someone's really ill, um, just thinking through with the individual the pros and cons of either proceeding now, or maybe postponing the test even a few weeks or a few months. You know, just to avoid you know those those events and and, and maybe making the the, the test um, a little bit easier uh, to do with in terms of the results when they do come. So as we said before, the, the test, are also, test results are also likely to have an impact on, on other people. And I guess that's down to the individual as to who they choose to, to tell in, in terms of um, them going through testing. Um, but obviously that often includes a partner and, and family. Um, and the family may include relatives who either have HD, uh, people who are at risk, or people who've had testing and, and know they're not at risk. And, and how this individual's results might sort of fit in with all, all that's gone before in the family. But also some people would involve 
you know wider friends and, and work colleagues and just thinking through how how that would be involving them in the process I guess often we find that people right quite rightly spend a lot of time thinking about how it would be to actually have the HD gene but maybe have given a little bit less consideration to what a gene negative result would actually feel like um, and people can actually experience some unexpected emotions having that result um, and some people do uh, feel guilty that they didn't inherit it or maybe feel almost less part of the family now that they've been excluded from having that, that risk and it's important to kind of consider those aspects as well as uh, as well as the, the aspects of, of having the gene. As we said before, I think it can be really helpful to think about and plan who people want to tell about about the, the test and about the result. And also when they would do this and how they would do it. Um, so, for example, some people may choose not to tell lots of people exactly when the results appointment is, even if they have an awareness that that person is going through testing, just so that they have a, 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 some time and space to get used to the result on their own before feeling that they have to inform all those people that, that know they're going through testing and just to have some control over that. We do usually recommend and it's, it's encouraging the guidelines that people bring uh, a support person uh, who can hopefully attend through the process if possible, uh, partly just to be a, an extra pair of ears uh, and to help think through what's discussed but also to support the person you know, between and after the appointments and particularly obviously after the results appointment um, when it comes. We'd also talk about some of the limitations of the test. So particularly that the test result can't predict uh, exactly when um, symptoms might start for an individual. And also that possibility that the, there might be a, a result in the, what's called the, sometimes the gray area. So either an intermediate or reduced penetrance uh, result which I'll come back to uh, in, a, in a few slides time so I guess it's uh, important that individuals considering a predictive test are aware that it could have implications and impact on on things like life insurance uh, critical illness cover or potentially health insurance particularly for countries where there's no state provision of healthcare. And obviously this will vary depending on the country and the local uh, rules and regulations around, uh, around that. So I would encourage people to, to check what situation uh, there is locally uh, in their country. For example, in the UK, there's currently an agreement in place uh, that insurance companies shouldn't use or ask for predictive testing results. They can ask about family history information about medical problems so so the history of hg in the family can be taken into account but what shouldn't um, be a factor is whether someone's had a predictive test themselves and, and that's um, an agreement that is reviewed every three years so that's in place at the moment we don't know how long term that will be so again we, we need to make people aware that things may change in the future around that and, and obviously having a test now you know may change what's available further down the line if, if that agreement does change um, and again it will be important to um, to check in in your country as to as to what is the um, situation regarding insurance in terms of um, the timeline and the time scale for predictive testing um, this is again likely to vary a little bit depending on local waiting lists and, and, and what testing arrangements are in place. Um, but the guidelines do recommend a minimum time of at least a month uh, between pre-test appointments to give the chance to reflect on what's been discussed between, between times. The process isn't designed to be a conveyor belt and, and really individuals should feel able to, to delay or decide not to proceed any further at any stage in the process. Um, and we'd really encourage people to simply take as long as they need to to be you know to be confident that they're making the right decision the right time for them you know and to be as prepared as possible for the results I guess in terms of who might be 
providing the predictive testing. Uh, again, it'll vary depending on country. Um, as I mentioned earlier, in the UK, predictive testing would be arranged through a genetic service, um, and it may involve either genetic, genetic counsellors or genetic specialist doctors. But different countries might have different arrangements around that, and sometimes that might involve services such as neurology, uh, psychology, or perhaps psychiatry. Uh, again, so, so you may need to check what local services would provide genetic testing in your country. I mentioned it a little bit before, and I won't go into lots of detail here, um, but just to highlight that the genetic test itself um, is basically where the laboratory count the number of CAG repeats in the HD gene. Uh, there's lots of information uh, on the HGEO website about CAG repeats. Um, but just to say here that for the majority of, of times, the result falls into either the, uh, the range where the individual wouldn't be expected to develop HD, so under 27 repeats, or in the range where we definitely expect HD, so above 39. Um, but there is that grey area that I mentioned uh, where things can be a little bit less certain and a little bit less definitive. Uh, so the, both the intermediate and reduced penetrance uh, results are possible scenarios that people need to be kind of familiar with and aware of uh, as a possibility going into having the test. Just thinking in terms of uh, follow-up after the test. So the predictive test process should definitely not end at the point of the results. Um, and we, as I said, we would usually offer a phone or a clinic follow-up, um, usually in the month or so after the result. Um, and also the, there may be the opportunity uh, for longer term follow-up, such as an annual review clinic to see how things are and um, check in with people um, every year as well as the possibility uh, to be involved in some of the research studies that are ongoing uh, now worldwide studies such as uh, the enroll study um, and potential uh, trials that may come as part of that research and i just wanted to to finish as i mentioned about um, some of the other resources that we often mention to people going through uh, testing that, that often people find helpful as a, as a resource outside the clinic um, so HDEO obviously needs no introduction here. It has lots of information about predictive testing, uh, as well as the genetics and, and background of HD. Um, most countries have some form of um, Huntington's Disease Association, uh, which again is a good source of information, uh, both about local services, uh, predictive testing uh, and support locally. Um, and one site that we often signpost people to uh, is predictive testing for hd.com. Uh, which, as the name suggests, is um, specifically aimed at people uh, either pr thinking about predictive testing or who have gone through uh, the process and, and has stories of, of, of people, um, people's experiences. Uh, HD Buzz isn't about genetic testing specifically, but is a site that's aimed to, to try and provide up to date and, and sort of accessible information for people without a science background um, about the current HD research that's going on. And many people want to keep in up to date with that and, and often find it useful to, to refer to HD Buzz uh, to get information about where research is, is up to. So I guess that brings me to the end of this webinar. And, um, uh, I hope it's kind of given a, an overview of, of some of the things that, that people should expect as part of the predictive test process. Um, obviously, there will be some differences, but, but these are the sorts of things that people um, often find helpful to talk through uh, in those pre-test appointments and, um, and hopefully is, is helpful just to give people a, a starting point really to, to thinking about predictive testing. So I'm happy to, um, to take questions as well at the end if anyone Thank you, Bill. Yeah, if anyone has any questions, um, we'll just put it in the chat there. Um, Bill, very good, thank you. I did have a question myself as well, if anyone's yeah. interested, you know, just to get some time. Um, you mentioned that people often come in with gut feelings. Yeah. Um, what is that? What is that percentage like then for HD? Is it mostly people think they're positive, or is it quite evenly split? Um, I think it, it's probably that most people feel they have it. Um, I mean, there are a fair number of people that um, that you know think they, they've got lucky and you know, hope for, hoping for that result. Um, but I think most people um, tend to be 
on the sort of more pessimistic side and and I think that's more about as I said trying to prepare themselves really for for that result um, and it kind of fits with that sort of coping coping strategy of preparing for the worst really yeah 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 that's what I did for mine was going in thinking I was going to have it really it was it was a coping mechanism yeah and I think that's a completely reasonable way of going and I think it's got lots of advantages I, I think in a way we uh, worry a little bit more actually about the people who don't think they have it and and whether they've they've really kind of taken on board you know what the repercussions might be and and, and just tend to explore things a bit more carefully um, around that if people are in that camp um, but the, I guess there's there's pros and cons. I have another question. Yeah sure. Um, obviously just speaking from your clinic but Testing siblings for Huntington's, um, does anything change um, when two siblings come in saying they want to get tested at the same time? Does your kind of plan of that change or do you have to have more caution? That's a really good question and, and obviously um, a good thing I should have put in the talk. Um, so yeah, no, it's, it's a really, really important point um, because it does happen fairly frequently that, that siblings come in either together or even at a very similar time um, to think about predictive testing and you know sometimes even people have made that sort of almost pact between them that they that they'll do that together and uh, and obviously there's there's reasons why that that could be very nice in terms of supporting each other through the process um, I think to counter that is is our our experience tends to suggest that there can be some real downsides in siblings going through testing at the same time um, and maybe not so much in HD but where we've done it in other uh, conditions um, people have really been struck by how they didn't expect their reactions around that if they, particularly obviously if they get different results um, you know and the impact that could have on their on their relationship as siblings um, so we tend to tread with caution I think is the is the answer to that I think we obviously look at the circumstances and um, and discuss that carefully with um, with siblings if they're coming together mm -hmm. um, what sometimes happens is that they they share some of the initial pretest appointments um, and then maybe we we have separate um, time later on and, and and particularly around testing and results it would be you know it would be very unusual and I, I think in our clinic we we haven't done it as far as I remember uh, where we've actually given results for example at the same time we would always have had some separate um, separation around the, the testing and the results stage yeah um, but yeah really good point and a really good question yeah I have another question this is great last. yeah no keep Let's see how you do so far <laughs> keep <good>. <laughs> Um, for those under 18 who are, you know, we get plenty who are interested in testing, maybe aren't quite sure, or some who are absolutely sure they want to get tested, but they're not 18 yet. Yeah. What happens with those? What's the possibilities there? So, again, thank you. That's a really, good, really good question. Um, so, um, I would encourage people to still seek out um, genetic services or genetics clinics um, to start that conversation with whatever age um, they are I think uh, it's good to start the process early um, the guidelines are there um, you know the, the guidelines do provide a, a recommendation around minimum age for testing and and I guess there has to be some line in the sand in that sense to give a, a, a sort of framework and uh, and obviously we wouldn't for example be wanting to test someone at, at eight or nine you know who really can't take on board maybe the, the long-term implications but you know lots of 16 year olds are perfectly capable of doing that just as well as a 20 year old or even a 30 year you know so so in some in some um, uh, you know the, the, the line in the sand is arbitrary at 18 um, we would I guess work work around that um, you know and, and think through carefully you know the the guidelines but also uh, the individual circumstances um, so you know I'm not saying that that no one would ever be tested under 18 but I think it would be unusual for that to happen normally it would be a conversation that would would evolve over over their their teenage years looking towards arranging testing you know once they've 
once they've got past that minimum age. Um, but it's but it's really trying to tailor it, as I said, to the individual. And uh, and I would encourage people to to not think that they have to wait until 18 to even come to a genetics clinic to start that process. It, it can be done, uh, you know, we can start that process earlier and there's lots of uh, advantages in that. Um, it's really about, you know, the issues are still the same at 16 or 19. It's just, um, you know, thinking through what, what the best um, time is for testing. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Does that answer that question? I'm sorry, that was a lot of rambling does. answer. <laughs> no, 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 it does. I think it does. Basically saying that if the 18 is a guideline, it's not an absolute rule. Yeah, I think, um, you know, I think talk about I think, it with you. Exactly. I think what I'd say is that there would have to be exceptional circumstances. Yeah. It would be, um, you know, the you know to break guidelines you know there, there has to be a really good reason um mm -hmm. you know and, and there are reasons that come up um but you know hopefully they're they're less common um but yeah it's 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 not an absolute yeah yeah okay super um i don't think anyone else has any more questions for you um, perfect so um, apologies again to garrett i think um uh, i uh forgot to to slow things down a little bit and hopefully maybe if it's been recorded uh Get, you get the chance to, to listen yes. back and um, and look back at it. But yeah, I didn't forget to record it, correct? So at least <laughs> you can watch it again, um, and everybody else can watch it again as well. Um, but thank you, everyone who uh, yeah. participated and turned up, and thank you to Bill for taking the time and giving us yeah, most welcome thank you. the lesson. It was much appreciated. Thank no, you, thank everybody. You. I wish you all good evenings, good days, good mornings, wherever you are. Um, and yeah, thank you. Bye-bye, folks. Thank you. Goodbye. Bye-bye.